discussion. Now we have a panel discussion on the topic of uh, investor relations in the era of transparency, new expectations and best practices. Can I please call on stage our moderator, Alexander Lagoa, strategist at Abdullah Al Arif Investment, as well as our panelists, which include Dr. Jihan Zahran, co-founder at Baya Egypt Consultancy, Anshuk Jain, chairman and MD at Design Your Unicorn, and Maya Makkar, international keynote speaker at Maya Talks Motivation. A round of applause for our panelists, thank you. Okay, so good morning everyone. Uh, I found out at the same time as you did that I was a moderator for this conversation. <laughs> so what's that right? We'll see we'll see how this goes. Uh, I suggest we start from right to left. Alex K for some Huh? Supposed to be Alex? Well look at Alex. Or introduce ourselves? Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay, so you guys probably know me by now, so my name is Maya Matkur. I'm a speaker, author, professor, and podcaster. Uh, my mission and purpose in life is to motivate and inspire. Short and sweet. Great, thanks. Uh, my name is Anshul Jain, and uh, I'm chairman and managing director of Designer Unicorn NFT $1 billion fund. So this is a $1 billion fund to fund the next 100 unicorns of India. I'm a serial entrepreneur, a speaker, uh, influencer, uh, you know, mentor, a author as well. So we have, uh, you know, I've authored almost 21 plus books by now. And uh, so that's about me. Hi, uh, Jehan Zahran, education and innovation consultant. Um, having a long journey for education specifically, K-12 and higher education, starting from an English teacher in 1997, till a professor in um, Carleton, Mass Communication and Business School, um, having my education in the States, between the States and Cairo in the bachelor. During that journey, I had actually lots of things between the academia and the industrial way. So I was having a business with Apple, I'm a consultant in Apple company for education, technology education specifically, here in UAE. Uh, Helping K-12 on higher education, how to use technology uh, through um, Apple ecosystem, just for the time being. Plus my consultancy, that's in education specifically, and helping the industries in uh, marketing strategies. Okay, so for the ones who are here yesterday afternoon, hello again. For the ones who still don't know my face, I'm Alex. I'm working as a strategist for Abla Life Investment, a family group. We have a total of 29 to 30 companies. Before that, I was deployed as a consultant strategy in operations across all of Europe. So in light of this panel's theme, I worked with very low level blue collar people to very high level white collar people to put this in. Thank you. So, may I will start? Uh, I'm not the moderator. <laughs> uh, can you have the first slide, please? Second one. Okay. Want to pick it up? Sure. We're gonna be spontaneous and impromptu, so just uh, we're gonna work together on this one. So essentially, we regrouped before traveling to Dubai, and we figured out that we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about entrepreneurial well-being. So I'll start first because we're talking about investor relations and investors typically look for a specific type of entrepreneur that they're gonna start investing in, right? Because you know you wanna spend your money and invest it wisely. So when it comes to entrepreneurial well-being, um, this was my master's dissertation actually, so it was basically merging self-determination theory, which is a theory, one type of theory on motivation, there's countless theories on motivation. But self-determination theory essentially uh, as it relates to entrepreneurial well-being. So in a nutshell, when it comes to your success as an entrepreneur and how you can sort of transcend all the challenges that you are bound to face as an entrepreneur because entrepreneurship is this tough, arduous journey, it's a meandering road and you never know what to expect, there's three conditions that have to be met. 
as part of that theory so you can thrive as an entrepreneur. So you need autonomy, competence, and relatedness. You need to, you need to feel like you have freedom. That's essentially what draws most of us to entrepreneurship is the fact that you get to exercise that freedom. You call the shots, you're the boss, you know, that kind of thing. That's what I think attracts many of us to the field of entrepreneurship. So you want to feel free, so autonomy is one of them. Competence is the second condition. You want to feel like you're competent at your job. You want to feel like you make a difference, that you're good at your job, that you are on top of things, that you're a game changer, that you're making a difference. So that's competence, that's the second condition. And then the third condition is relatedness. We're social beings by nature, we're social creatures by nature. We crave that social human connection. So as an entrepreneur, if you, if you cross those, if you, if you check those three boxes of autonomy, competence, and relatedness, um, that's gonna make you a, a, a better bet as, as an investor, when people are. Absolutely. Uh, can you please switch on this, uh, you know, put the slides that the speaker is speaking? Thank you. Yeah, so the next one you can put up. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, so first of all, I would like to ask a question out here, which is my favorite question being from India and a patriot as an Indian. So how many of you know that India was called as a golden bird or in Hindi we call it as Sone Ki Chidiya? How many of you know that India was called as a golden bird? Oh, very few. How many of you do not know that India was called as a golden bird? Quite a lot, quite a lot. So, one of the things which is very important to know that India was the wealthiest country for thousands of years before we lost our independence in 1192. Anyway, the story is not about that. But one of the things which I want to share with you, all of you right now, that India is the third largest startup ecosystem in the world at this point in time. Uh, India is having the largest diaspora and the largest populated country as well. Uh, the way Indian government is, everybody is focusing on uh, making it as a startup and skills capital of the world as well. Now, one more question which I would like to ask. How many of you know that, what are the investment opportunities available across the globe? Real estate? How many you know? Real estate? You have invested in real estates? Not in India, anywhere across the globe. Oh, few. Stocks? Still more hands. How about cryptocurrencies? No. Wow. And startups? Quite a lot. Quite a lot. In fact, startups are much more than real estate. The reason why I ask this question, they're talking about investments here. And I'm not sure that if you know, most of the real estate investments are dead now they are actually giving negative returns to people versus what they were getting positive returns. I'm not talking about a country like Dubai or some places, but in general I'm talking about. The real market, the interest, what are the investors benefit coming in is from investments in startups, investments in early stage businesses, technology driven businesses, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, metaverse, and other deep tech technologies where people are investing their money. Be it Silicon Valley or Indian startup ecosystem or a Israel ecosystem. I think all of you should actually go and outside, and I'm not promoting them, they're not part of us, but there's a beautiful virtual reality mirror which is kept, us, uh, kept there. You should look at uh, out there, what, is the startups, what are the startups doing at this point in time? The point what I'm trying to drive out here is that if you want to invest in startups, there are three major reasons why people are not able to invest in startups today. The number one is the high ticket size. You have to have at least $100,000, $50,000 to invest in a good startup. And it may not be possible for you, everybody, each and everybody to evaluate a startup to that extent that you will put your hard and money into that particular startup out there, be it anywhere across the globe. The second reason by which, because of which people are not able to invest, I, I don't know how many of you know this fact, nine out of 10 startup investments fail. Do you know that? How many of you know this? Yeah, so quite a few. And that makes it a super risky investment, however, with the highest return possible. How many of you know Facebook? 
Okay, I think some people are a little busy right now. How many of you do not know Facebook? Okay, good. So that gives me the answer. Thank you so much for me for sharing that. Peter Thiel, he invested five hundred thousand dollars when he sold his company PayPal, which was co-founded with uh, Elon Musk, and he made one point one billion dollars in cash in just eight years. And he still had Facebook shares with him at that time. This was 2004 story to 2012. Zomato, which is Indian startup unicorn, one of the first hundred unicorns of India. Investors who invested 10 lakh rupees, Indian rupees, I think close to uh, 10,000 dollars. I'm just giving it as a uh, you know uh, generic example. 10,000 dollars in 2010. They have made two lakh two thousand twenty four thousand uh, two twenty four thousand percent returns in just eleven years of time, which is an Indian value is two twenty four crores, and that's the kind of value you get wherein it is about twenty to four forty x returns in eleven years time, and that's the possibility you have, but there are losses as well. And you have to be a little careful on that, evaluate on that, and that is why we are making it more aware uh, about the angel investing into startups because that's the best way to transform any economy into a number one economy or a growing economy. So that is the second challenge, loss of capital. The third challenge, liquidity. What if you need money at any point in time? You want your money back, you won't get it unless the startup gives you the exit. But with the Design Your Unicorn platform, you can actually, it's a decentralized startup investment platform where you can de liquidate your shares at any given point in time from any investor across the globe. And you'll find the investors there. It's like a virtual uh, market, uh, virtual uh, you know, stock market which brings across cross sector and cross border startups into that. So the point what I'm trying to say is, if you're wanting to make an investor, you know, investment grow, maybe become a billionaire from just a being a billionaire, or just investing a couple of thousands of you know, dollars and becoming a millionaire in less than 10 years time, this is the only opportunity available at this, in this decade. So explore that opportunity and that is what it is more important that you should be focusing on finding out the right investment opportunities. Work on your risk appetite and work with the funds which can give you some kind of a principal protection and support to understand the ecosystem around that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk about actions. Okay. Uh, what uh, orange color mean to you? What the orange color mean to you? Excuse me? Present? Possibilities. Seems you have an experience. <laughs> uh, yeah, it has a lot of things actually. So, orange? Me to you, what? Healthy. Healthy? Healthy. Yeah. Healthy. Orange means energy. Alright, this color is energetic. So, so, that's why there is something from the economy called orange economy. I hope that you heard about that kind of orange economy. I think it's, uh, it's now a little bit higher in, uh, in the Gulf, uh, especially in UAE, Dubai mainly, for orange economy ranking countries that in the top of innovation, right? So because orange economy related to innovation, anything comes from innovative process, innovative uh, initiative, so it's called or it's directed to the orange economy. And definitely, innovation comes from education, right? So let's come back to the, our topic, which is so related to investors in the era of transparency. Uh, 
which is coming from the entrepreneurship, right? I'll talk about actions, something happened, all right? And maybe we can have a challenges about it. I'll tell you how it goes. Maybe it can be duplicated, or we can talk later about how it goes. This is actually, it's a governmental level. Um, we see first what's the challenge for the startups. What their challenge all the time? I think I need to stand up. Sorry. <laughs> so, any, any startup, he has an idea of how the idea is. So, what his challenge is all the time? What do you think? What the challenge? Negotiation? Innovation? Money! Yes, money! I'm suffering. Definitely, if he has the idea, alright, and this idea is not complete, he can go to a consultant or advisor, he can know what the business plan is, how to make it in a professional way, and then it comes to the complete side of the idea itself as in startup, so he needs the money, right? As in a governmental perspective, they already have funds from all the places for the ministers, right? UN, whatever, um, all the investors, businessmen in the company itself or in the country. So they are investing in that, but how can we reach them? This is the issue, the stairs, the steps, the challenge. So. The initiative was uh, something related to how we are getting the startup entrepreneurs to the fund. All right? We made a prototype. This prototype is helping anyone for free just to go into that prototype and he go to the advisors to complete his idea and the funds are there and it's already governmental issues and they are so completed like that so he is completing this and once he get the find and he find this himself complete he pick him and after he pick him he just go in a process with that fund and if he continue this he plucked with the other funds process so simply it's something uh i would like to show you what um it was yeah, we don't have time for that. It's not time, uh, actually. Maybe I can get it. Actually, there. you know, what she mentioned is a very important point. Because one of the important aspects when we invest in startups is about technology, innovation, how the deep technologies are coming up, and yeah. most importantly, the founder's coachability, the founder's motivation. Because entrepreneurship is not easy. It's going to take, you know, literally the blood of your nerves. So you have to make sure that you identify the right entrepreneur at an early stage because it's not a company yet, full-fledged company. So you have to, you are actually betting on the jockey rather than the horse. So it is still just a, you know, small pony uh, which is being there, forget about being a unicorn. So you have to be very careful. And I think considering this, I would really want to ask this question to Alex now. Because Alex comes from a background of family offices and Alex, when you look at uh, from the investing perspective in these startups, uh, what do you think that you take care of when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, the investor, I mean, to the entrepreneurs and the business idea and what is the kind of market size aspect which you take care of? Okay. The key word here is very simple, it's homework. Before I even think about investor relations, before I even think about investment, I have to look at myself, my company, and first, what are my core values, as we discussed this morning, what aligns itself with these core values, and what may I look into that may eventually become aligned with this. And secondly, most importantly, I can look at whatever numbers people give me, I can look at whatever projections people give me, Anyone can do a projection for five years for 500, 1,000, 1,500. I don't know how much percentage you want to put in. 
anyone can make a projection. The key here is the person. The key here is the energy the person transmits. The key here is how the person speaks. Because one big truth in life, which is sad, remains true, is that a person who smokes, for example, I smoke, I will never be a non-smoker. The best I can achieve in that department is to become an ex-smoker. The same thing goes for lying. I am an honest person throughout my whole life. I never lied once. I'm 65 years old. I lie once. I become a liar. And it is in this new era where any one of us in our pockets, not mine, I have my phone there, but in our pockets, we have access to much more information that we can ever assimilate in a single lifetime. There is probably more information being diffused right now that we can process in an entire lifetime. With all this information, it is very easy to catch a lie. So, if an investor comes in, talks to us, I did this A, B, C, D, but in one very small aspect, something as simple as I have two kids, but in fact he only has one. Done. Does anyone have any idea what's the lead conversion, let's call lead conversion ratio for a regular private equity firm? It stands at, does anyone want to give a ballpark number? So from is analysis it, to is conversion. Is it point one percent? Sorry? Point one percent? Or one percent? Point zero three. Oh. So the private equity firms, which may have arguably the best analysts in the world, have a huge powerhouse of very, very smart people running numbers for a conversion of point zero three percent. Some some of them have due diligence lists, checklists that go up to 200 to 250 points. Something as simple as, what's the price of the CEO's car compared to the revenue? If it stands at above 1%, I'm out. And myself and any one of you can probably find out any of these points related to any investor. We have a very big case. Of two, I'm going to give two, two examples. One very, very big case of a very well-crafted investor relationship management is FTX. I don't know if you, you are familiar with the case. We have the, sadly or not so sadly, depend where, depends on where you stand. Its founder is now in wearing orange. Um, <laughs> yeah, he created blockchain crypto. I'm not a technological expert. And he started buying assets. Those assets in the books, so in the official communications, have a certain value. There was a bank which was closed. The, it was approximately 200 square feet. It, they valued it in their books at $125 million. Simple as that. And this is what they communicated. Once something, this or something else, was found out, everything crumbled. A second example. Bernie Madoff, we all heard about Ponzi schemes. We all know how they work. It's terrible. But if communicated properly, if handled properly, it isn't. How many of you know Herbalife? The concept is the same. It's a bubble. I get one investor, the job of that investor is to get five more. And I grow, and I grow, and I grow. And they were very, very, very honest from the start. This is how we operate. This is how we want to grow our business. This is how we will do it. Bernie Madoff didn't do that. And now, again, he's wearing orange. So, in fact, there are stages of investments when it comes to startups. Uh, you know, it starts from a retail investor where you can even invest with small amounts like $5,000, $10,000. And it can go to angel investments, which can go to hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars investment. Like Skype got a hundred thousand dollars investment. Uh, similarly, you will uh, you will have the next level where it comes in as a pre-series A, series A, series B, and C. 
So there are various levels of investments uh, which is actually, you know, you can uh, create, uh, identify that yourself where you fit in and do your investments and take benefits. But before that, I think we are running short of time. So I will have one minute. I would want to ask one question to you, Maya. Uh, with respect to psychology of an investor, uh, identifying the right set of uh, uh, entrepreneur out there, what do you suggest that what investor should kind of keep it in, in his or her mind while looking at the right startup to invest? Uh, that's a great question, Akshar. Thank you for that. So as an investor, or if an investor is trying to source the perfect entrepreneur, let's, I want to first caveat that statement by saying there's no such thing as a perfect entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and forms and races and gender. It's just it's the, that person does not exist. But I think there are some qualities that we need to possess as entrepreneurs, and um, they stand the test of time. They are, they just transcend all of those. They transcend race and gender and education. You know, and it's, it's many of them are cliches, and many of them you've heard before. So I'm certainly not reinventing the wheel here, but I think if just very basically, you need just a few basic things that like off the top of my head right now are Like find out why you're really here. Um, just going back to the, the panel this morning on values, find out what your purpose is, find out what your passion is. And once you do that, the roadmap, the roadmap is gonna become is going to become evident to you. So find out what you're passionate about, find out what your purpose is, and by all means, not don't don't only just practice resilience and anti-fragility as Nazarino was talking about, just also um, Grit. You need. You're gonna need to have grit as an entrepreneur because, you know, Murphy's law is gonna be in the room. Murphy's law is gonna be present. Every single thing that you can possibly conceive of and imagine that could go wrong will go wrong, and then a hundred other scenarios are going to go wrong. It's just part and parcel of what being an entrepreneur is all about. So you need to be very adept at picking yourself back up again every single time you fall. But then every single time you do that, you're stronger for it. You learn from it, and then that helps you on your next hurdle. So that's, that's essentially... Absolutely. I think being a serial entrepreneur, this is one of the major aspects which is important. It has to be, you know, passion, passionate about whatever you build. And that comes only from purpose. And once you have that purpose driven, I think you will persevere through all the difficult aspects of life and the challenges you are going to force, whether it is funds or team or anything else. Uh, but before we move on uh, to the question and answers, one last question to you, uh, Dr. Jihan. In terms of technology and innovation, what do you think that an entrepreneur has to focus upon? Because that is a critical aspect when it comes to scalability. So what is the message you would like to tell to investors how to evaluate these startups? So before we, we, we talk about how the investors that think about the technology skills in the entrepreneur, uh, we can take about, again, an action that has been done in K-12 or higher education that combining, actually, the technology in terms of skill, all right, and financial literacy in the K-12 or higher education. There is an initiative from Apple, actually, in the Swift coding, uh, and... Uh, Financial literacy, this is something that really uh, integrated with the curriculum here in UAE uh, for the schools from K-12 International and they are putting in the part of uh, activities, blending learning in activities in all curriculum So and also in Innovation Summit. So it gives a time within the curriculum itself to how the students exactly know how to make his own project from early years, um, how to know what means technical report and business report, all right, to his business plan, and then combining it financial literacy, budgeting. So at the end, he knows from early years how to go in business plan when he grants. Moreover, investors, when they are integrating and in some of the activities related to investors here, we, they can see who is the one who can come up with a business plan. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So I think financial literacy and technology expertise are important. And there are actually different skill sets which an entrepreneur has to possess and which investors also should know. That is why uh, it's called, they are also called as investpreneurs. So for, focus on that. Uh, Alex, do you want to add something before we open up for question and answers? It's very simple. When looking at an investor, look at the investor before you look at the investment. And second, if you are looking for investment, don't lie. Don't dissimulate. It's really not worth it. Very important. We have like three and a half minutes for questions. Yeah, don't lie in general, I think, just in life, right? <laughs> yeah, but just, uh, absolutely. In that, the, the panel. <laughs> yes. Hi, guys. That was excellent. I have one question. Just in general, how much kind of control, you know, obviously, kind of when you get investors in, you know, some people are kind of going to want to be in the weeds. And I think, Alex, you mentioned, like, look at the investor. You know, should there be synergies between kind of an investor skill set and your business? Or um, should you, you know, should you expect a lot of meddling? From, I'm going to use the term meddling, do you know what I mean? But kind of like oversight from investors. Like, what do you think is the right balance? Every case is a case. We've invested in companies that came into our holding group and because they attached very easily to something we have. As an example, okay, we have a, contractor, a contracting factory. There's someone that comes in, look, I have an interior design studio. Well, of course, come in. And there are some people that came, look, I have this brand new idea. I think this would, could work because A, B, C, D, and E. And we never even looked at the investment because it doesn't touch anything we are doing right away. It doesn't touch anything we were thinking about doing. But the person was so passionate and so knowledgeable, and again, went through our own checklist of due diligence. We made him suffer. We put some tough questions on top of the on top of the table, and he answered them. And the ones this is very important. The ones that he did not know the answer to, he specifically said, "I do not know. I will find out." And this is what made us invest in these three people now. Uh, I'm not sure if I heard your question properly, but are you trying to ask that if an entrepreneur coming to raise the fund, what is the aspect which we funds take care of, look after for? Hello. Hello. Basically, what it was, was um, investors are going to put a level of oversight on their investment, okay? And when you decide to get someone else's money into your organization, give away some of the autonomy and the, the thing is is like you as a visionary as it were and you want to go and create this new thing where's the balance to the right level of oversight and involvement from an investor versus you as the creator of, of the product where does that sit okay very good question actually uh, see one of the challenge being transitioning from a serial entrepreneur to a venture capitalist at this time it's a difficult journey to pass by uh, one of the important aspects you should look at, there are three parameters which we always define in our design and unicorn proprietary methodology as well. Uh, so number one is called business sustainability index. So when you work as an entrepreneur, you have to, or even when you're looking from the eyes of an investor, you have to see whether the business is sustainable in the long run. The second is investment readiness index. Is it investable business where most of other investors would be interested to invest in them because investors make money on exits. They don't make money from the profits. But the continuity is important for the entrepreneur to keep it sustainable. The third aspect which is the prime most important which is called founder's coachability index. So if your founder is ready to learn different challenges of the businesses, I think that is the right entrepreneur. As she said, it's not going to be a good walk, it's not going to be easy pitch, but if you are able to figure it out, that's what an entrepreneur should be focusing upon, and that's what investors should be identifying the entrepreneur. We have 14 seconds left. <laughs> One more question we can take. Yeah. <laughs> we answered every single doubt anyone had. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.